to commemorate Hernando de Soto's expedition of 1539, as well as to commemorate the Native Americans that he encountered on this expedition. Now, Hernando de Soto and his man, men landed here in Tampa Bay, May 30th, 1539, and it would be the beginning of a four-year, 4,000-mile four expedition throughout the Southeast United States. Uh, him and his men would travel through what's now um, 10 modern U.S. states, and they would come into contact with hundreds of thousands of Native Americans who had been living through the Southeast for centuries before European contact. Now, uh, this expedition is a, we commemorate it because it's very important in our history. Uh, it was the first major European expedition into the interior of North America. It would pave the way for further European exploration and colonization by the Spanish as well as the French and uh, later on the British. So it's important in that aspect. It's also important because of the contact that the Europeans made with uh, Native Americans at the time. Like I said, this was the first major incursion into North America. So it was a clash of two cultures, Europe and North America. And we to say that this uh, conflict of a culture was disastrous for the Native Americans. Uh, here in Florida, you had a 90% mortality rate of the Native American population. So after European contact, we used to say Native American uh, society and uh, culture collapsed because of that. So when we talk about these two cultures coming into contact, we tend to think of two very different cultures. I mean, after all, they have, uh, they have been separated by thousands of miles across the Atlantic Ocean, as well as uh, thousands of years of cultural evolution because of that separation. But in more ways than not, they are similar. Uh, for example, their governmental structures are uh, very identical. For example, in Europe you have uh, the king on top and he uh, has his lords, lieges, and knights beneath him controlling smaller uh, sections of his kingdom. And the Native Americans had a similar structure. You had a chief uh, at the top who controlled the uh, chiefdom and he would have smaller villages controlled by lesser chiefs. So in the same way we have a uh, parallel there. We also have a parallel in weaponry. Now weaponry is a great way for us to compare the two cultures because it gives us a mindset into some of their ideas and thinking and their cultural values. After all, uh, weaponry and warfare tends to be the cutting edge of technology for cultures. So it's a great way for us to look at it. It's also very hands-on. I'm going to start with two very simple weapons. I'm guessing y'all can figure out the Native American and European <laughs> weapon. Fairly straightforward. So what I have here is, this is a Native American war club. Now it's uh, made out of mangrove roots. All the trees you see out in our swamp there, that's what this is made out of. And what the Native Americans would do is they take this root, bring it back to uh, their village, and they bury it underground. Build a nice hot fire over top of it. And what that fire did was it dehydrated this wood, sucked the moisture out of it, made it extremely hard and durable. You can see here. Whoops. <laughs> I took out the camera. Kill the camera. Yeah, kill the camera. So as you can see, we've been hitting this around now about uh, 10 years. It's only got some minor cracks to it, but it hasn't rotted any. Like I said, it was made of extremely durable. It's a very simple concept as well. Take this weapon here, clock your enemy over the head with it, they're going to go down, right? Now the Europeans had the exact same idea. That they used what was known as a European mace. Now, it's the same concept. Take this, clock your enemy over the head with it, and they're going to go down. But they had to adapt this weapon for European warfare. At the time, you're fighting other Europeans. So they had what this is made out of right here. Whoops. They had metal technology. Oh, this is not going well already. So they had metal technology. So they had to adapt this weapon to overcome that. And the way they would use this is kind of like a baseball bat. Take a nice big swing at somebody's chest plate that they're wearing like that, and it would dent it. And you were trying to constrict around that person, make it difficult for them to breathe, difficult for them to move, make them an ineffective in uh, make them ineffective in battle. Now, little weapon has a dirty secret. See all these holes here? It's not for aerodynamics, and it's not for uh, making it lightweight. It was to add little appendages, nails, spikes, hooks, chains. So when you swing that club right into that chest plate now, it's going to pierce through that armor, hopefully catch a, a pop of lung, and then you can also use it as a can opener. You pry that metal armor off of somebody, take it, make it completely useless. Now that person is completely out of the battle. They have no protection, and they probably go down for the count as well. So as we can see with these two weapons, they're very similar, uh, very um, uh, crude concept, but they're adapted for the uh, culture that they're fighting in. Now, if you're familiar here with Florida, 
Um, if you dig down a couple of feet, what are you going to find aside from water? Sand. Jump in the gun, Tommy. Yes, sand. You're going to find sand. You're going to find shell. A little bit of limestone. But you won't find any metal. You won't find any natural rock. So the Native Americans had to adapt. And one of the resources that they had at their disposal was, as you said, shark's teeth. Now this is a Calusa war saber. The Calusa are a native tribe of Florida located a little bit further south of us near uh, Fort Myers. What they would do is they would go out and hunt shark as part of their diet. When they did this, they would also extract the shark's teeth right from its mouth. Uh, after all, shark's teeth are in Mother Nature's own knives. They are designed uh, to be sharp and serrated to cut through flesh easily. So this made a very effective weapon for the Calusa. Now, Florida for nine months of the year, kind of like today, it's hot and it's humid. So the Native Americans, they're just wearing this, simple loincloth. Now, do you think this is going to provide any protection against this weapon? No, it's just going to tear right through it. So, this, like I said, this made a very effective weapon against other Native Americans. However, when the Europeans came here, they brought with them their metal technology and armor. Now, this is going to do nothing to this metal. It is going to bounce right off the top of it. Any little scratch can buff out later, but you're pretty safe with this wearing this going up against a war saber. So the Native Americans realized that their weapons were completely useless against uh, uh, European armor that was coming to the New World. They also faced another disadvantage. That was the European weaponry, the parallel to the saber, which is the sword. Now prior to uh, the discovery of the New World, the Spanish had been fighting for over 700 years in the Reconquista of Spain. They were retaking their homeland from the Muslim Moors. So because of all these many years of fighting and warfare, they had become extremely proficient in metallurgy. Their swords now were lighter, they were stronger, more durable, sharper. And this gave them a great advantage here in the DeSoto expedition. This pro uh, DeSoto, when he was planning to come to La Florida, this was not his first time to the New World. He had been here once before when he was a 14-year-old boy in Central America, and second time as a captain in the Pizarro brothers, conquering the Incan Empire. So he was very familiar with Native American warfare and their tactics. And the way that they fought was what we call guerrilla warfare. Uh, Native Americans would lie in wait using the, uh, the forests, the swamps, to conceal their position, and they would wait for their enemy. Gaining, uh, they would ambush them, gaining the element of surprise as an advantage. So DeSoto, knowing this, he wanted to make sure his men were prepared. So he mandated that every man on the expedition to La Florida carried with them a sword or a dagger at all times. Now, if you can picture yourself, just got done with a long day's hiking 13 miles through the swamps. You set up camp at the end of the night and you go off to the, uh, into the woods to take care of some of your business. Next thing you know, there's a Native American coming out from behind a tree, charging at you with a Calusa war saber, screaming at the top of his lungs. You've got to be able to protect yourself. So you draw your sword, you now have the great advantage. You can take, you are easily able to outmatch his weapon, cutting through it since it is made out of wood, and now he doesn't have any armor to protect himself. So the sword certainly swung the uh, battlefield in the favor of the Europeans. Now, the Native Americans, they weren't stupid. They realized they were at a great disadvantage because of this metal technology. So they needed to adjust their tactics and, uh, in order to uh, take down the Spanish. So they turned to their apex weapon, the bow and arrow. Now, the bow and arrow had been part of Native American culture for thousands of years. So it was very familiar to them. For all a young Native American boy would get his first bow at the age of eight years old. And he would train with it every day. He would go out into the forest hunting small game, squirrels, rabbits, uh, birds. He would also play a game in the village called Chunky. Now, Chunky a stone kind of like a hockey puck about this big and all the young warriors would line up in a row and they would roll this disc on the ground and they would shoot it as it's rolling along so they became very skilled marksmen because of this after all there's a lot riding on this game it was not just that they would place wagers on it but it was also about family honor so becoming skilled was definitely a necessity now this bow has several other advantages it's extremely stealthy when you fire this it doesn't make a lot of noise so you're able to conceal your position. Uh, it's also very uh, mobile. You can move from spot to spot, firing on the move with this weapon. And it's also very uh, fast. You can fire many shots with this weapon quickly. A good Native American warrior could fire 20 to 30 arrows a minute with this. 
So all of these combined to make the Native American archer a very um, effective fighting uh, force. Uh, this, it was one of the few things the Spanish actually wrote down that was good about the Native Americans, was their bowmen. They, be act, they began to call them ghosts because they would ambush the Spanish so quickly and quietly that they wouldn't even be able to mount a defense before the Native Americans were gone back into the swamp. You wouldn't even see them. So this became a very important weapon for the Native Americans. Now the Europeans, they also had bow and arrow at this time. But theirs was a little bit different. In European warfare, we have what was known as formalized warfare. Two armies would meet on a battlefield going head to head, uh, clashing against each other. You'd have foot soldiers, you'd have knights on horseback. And behind that formation, you would have your archers, kind of like modern artillery. They would sit in the back on a hill or a bluff, and they would take high arching shots raining down on their enemy. Now, it was, ex it was still a skilled position. They had trained for years upon years to get to this position, but like I said, it's a little bit different than a Native American. Fortunately, at the time in Europe, they were being replaced. They're going out of style because of this, the crossbow. The crossbow simplified all of the complexities of the bow, and as well as it improved its strength. You no longer had to train somebody from a young age to be an archer. You now could take any Joe off the street, sober him up, hand him this weapon, in about two hours time, he's gonna be accurate and he's gonna be deadly. He's also replaceable now. Like I said, you didn't have to train him for all these years. Now, the crossbow improved the strength of the bow because it no longer was made out of uh, wood, it was made out of metal. This exponentially in increased the force behind that bolt. It can now punch through all of this plate mail and chain mail armor that knights were wearing. It, it changed the European battlefields because of this. There is a slight drawback to this weapon. Uh, it can be slow and cumbersome to load. This is a light, lightweight model for demonstration. It takes about 80 pounds of pull to draw this string back and cock it, but some of these uh, crossbows could have anywhere from 200 up to 1,200 pounds of force. So it would take two men and a pulley system to load this weapon. So as you, you can kind of figure, that would be even slower than this. Now I need a volunteer to stand up on that wall there with an apple on their head. <laughs> no takers? All right. I would just have to fire at our target then. Now, I'm going to give you all a demonstration, kind of show you all the advantages and disadvantages of these weapons. Uh, the thing to know when I'm firing them is listen for the sound that they make. The sound will give you a good indication of its strength and uh, power. You can see it can be very mo mobile, very stealthy, and fire quickly with this weapon. A, it makes a very soft thud when it hits the target as well, which is exactly opposite of the crossbow. Let's see if this wants to cooperate this time. Here, it's got a lot more power behind it, but you can also see it is a bit slower to load this weapon <laughs> if, as long as it's cooperating. <laughs> and like I said, that's the lightweight model, so you can imagine how much longer it would take if I had to crank it back with a pulley system. So, as we've seen with all of these weapons, they kind of have a similar version in each of the cultures. You've got, for example, the sword in Europe and the saber in uh, North America. And they're each, even though they're similar, they're each adapted to their environment. But there is one weapon the Europeans had that the Native Americans could not touch. It's a 16th century archivist. Now this is a smooth bore matchlock gun. And this is the great 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 granddaddy to all of our modern guns. Um, at the time in Europe, guns were in its infancy. So if you wanted to become an archivist seer, uh, Uncle Sam, there was no Uncle Sam to give you your gun. Uh, you couldn't go to a pawn store or a gun shop to buy one. You had to make your own. You had to go to three people in order to do this. First person you went to was a locksmith, and he would make this trigger mechanism. Second person you go to, your carpenter, make this uh, wooden stock. Third person you go to, 
is a uh, blacksmith, and you would make this metal barrel. Now you go home and you assemble the three parts together, and you get lock, stock, and barrel, <laughs> which is where we get the term from. Now, because of this, no two guns were alike. They were all unique. Uh, the barrel lengths were different, the bore size was different, the lead balls that they fired were different and imperfect. So this led to a lot of in, uh, inaccuracy with this weapon. Uh, it was also inaccurate because I said it's a smooth form, which means when this the inside of this barrel is completely smooth and the lead ball tends to uh, ping pong down the barrel and when it reaches the muzzle it's going to go whichever way it wants, up, down, left, right. It's not like a modern gun where we have rifling, which means there's a groove in here that spins the bullet. Makes it like an NFL quarterback pass, nice tight spiral that adds accuracy. Now, this inaccuracy with the gun didn't really matter much in Europe. So as we said, we had formalized warfare. There were rows of men lined up in front of you. So let's say I'm Spanish and I'm fighting against the French. If I am aim for the guy in the center of the line, but I hit two guys down, does it really matter? I hit, the, I hit a Frenchman, he's down, I'm doing my job, right? But do you think the Native Americans were going to line up in nice neat rows in a turkey shoot for DeSoto and his men? No, they were going to stick with their guerrilla warfare uh, tactics. So why then do you think DeSoto would have brought 60 to 70 arquebusiers with him on the expedition, knowing that it was inaccurate? Any guesses? Scare them. Scare them, exactly. He was going to use this weapon to intimidate the Native Americans. Now, picture yourself. As a Native American in your village, these strange men wearing all this hard, shiny skin show up at your doorstep. They're speaking in a tongue you don't understand. They're demanding slaves, they're demanding food, and they're demanding gold. Like I said, you don't understand them, of course. The next thing you know, 20 of these guns go off at the same time. There's a bright flash and a loud bang. You have no idea what just happened. But you're going to relate it to something you are familiar with, something in nature like Lightning. Fire. Lightning and thunder, exactly. So DeSoto was trying to bluff his way into getting what he wanted, convincing the uh, some of the Native Americans that he could harness the power of thunder and lightning in a stick, that he could control the elements of nature, and that he was a god. Uh, some of the Native Americans believed him, some of them didn't. But those that did, they gave into his demands. They gave him the slaves he needed to carry his gear. They gave him the food he needed to feed his uh, troops and his uh, uh, co convoy. And then they told him, go north, the next village over. They have the gold. So in this way, this gun actually saved a lot of DeSoto's men's lives because he didn't have to waste it, uh, waste his resources by going to battle. He just took it by scaring them. Now, as the uh, expedition progressed, the men ran out of supplies. They didn't have any lead balls to fire. They didn't have any black powder. So, but the men, the arquebusiers, held onto this gun. Because as we said, they built it themselves. This was their ticket to riches and glory. Now in the third year of the expedition, we got a little spoiler here, Fernando de Soto dies. Sorry to ruin that for y'all. Um, he dies in the third year, and at this time, his men decide, all right, we've had enough. We haven't found any gold. We're out of supplies. Let's go back to Spain. So they decide they are going to march from the Mississippi River all the way through Texas down into the Mexico, where there is a Spanish colony on the Gulf Coast. Now if you're familiar with Texas, what is in the middle of it? Desert. Desert. A whole lot of nothing. So DeSoto's men realize they've made a terrible mistake. They turn around, they retrace their steps all the way back to the Mississippi River. But by this time, DeSoto, or by this time, the Native Americans kind of call their bluff. They realize they're not gods. So they begin to ambush them and attack them constantly. This DeSoto's men realize they need to get out of North America quickly, or else they're all gonna die. So they take this gun, they melt down the barrel and the metal and they make nails. They use those nails to build small ships to sail down the Mississippi River, out into the Gulf of Mexico where they sail along the coast to that Spanish colony I told you about. From there, those survivors, some of them return home to Spain where they record their tale of survival. And it's one of the uh, resources we have to understanding what happened in the DeSoto expedition. So this way, this gun ended up saving even more lives, not because of its firepower, but because of its material resources. Now, we like to end our presentation with a bang. So I'm going to fire this gun for y'all, but I want to explain being about an arquebusier real quick. Arquebusier was not an easy job on this expedition. You had a couple things you had to do at all times, and it made it extremely uh, difficult. First thing you had was your match cord. This was your ignition source for this gun. And you would have six to ten feet of this uh, cord either wrapped around your neck, your torso, or the barrel of your gun. 
and both ends of it would be lit at all times. That way you were ready for battle. Now, you can imagine how difficult it is trying to keep a match lit all day walking through the swamps and humidity of Florida in the middle of the summer. It's a tedious task. Now, second problem with carrying that match cord is with what I'm wearing right now. Now, the, this is called a bandolier, and each one of these wooden flasks contains in a black powder charge to fire my gun. And you see the danger of me carrying all this black powder around my chest, as well as dangling a match right next to it. Hold it for a second. No, thank you. It's extremely dangerous. I was not the most popular guy in camp because a little thing called bandolier burn. Occasionally a mat, uh, stray ember would land on this flask, catch it on fire, and start a train explosion. Boom, 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 boom. It's extremely painful. So yeah, you can imagine how, da how dangerous this was. Now the final thing that made this job dangerous is that this gun takes a long time to load. A good arquebus here could fire two, maybe three shots a minute if he's good. How many arrows did I say a Native American can fire? Eight, 20. 20 to 30. So you can imagine if I'm a uh, nice stationary target trying to load this thing, I'm probably going to look like a porcupine before I even fire one <laughs> shot with this. Uh, Ranger Abraham here is going to lead me through a series of commands to fire this gun, give you all an idea of all the steps involved with uh, firing this weapon. Uh, we are firing real black powder, so there will be a bang. We'll let you know when to cover your ears. Uh, we will not be firing a real lead ball, though. Uh, there's a lovely beach and river on the other side of that wall, and sinking a ship is not on my agenda because there is a mound of paperwork about this high. <laughs> Whenever you're ready. Attention. Shoulder arm. Wear it. Your weapon. Present an arm. Blow off your bed. Hand your prime flask. And fry. Close your pan, catch up your chest of powder, pull off your plan, catch up with weapons from sword side. Hand your charging flask, charge, and load your paper wash. Take a scout stick, short, ramp. Take a short for a wave. Shout for 10 arms. Right hand takes man. Blowing man. Set, set. This time, ladies and gentlemen, you might want to cover your ears. Ready? Eight. Match. Did you get him? Go off your pen. Shoulder arms. Present arms. And then fired salute to the ground. Ole! Ole!